the males perform what's called a stink fight. So when it's breeding season, the males kind of have to compete for the females. And what they will do is they'll make themselves all smelly with those scent glands, rub the, that scent all over their tail, and then they wave their tails at each other. And whoever's the stinkiest wins the girl. So it's pretty cool um, to find that out about them. Uh, you also might notice if you see them walking, sometimes they'll hold their tails up in an S shape. And that's because when they're walking along the ground, so ring-tailed lemurs actually spend the most time on the ground out of all the lemurs. Most lemurs are arboreal, which means they live up in the trees. These guys still do live up in the trees, but they spend about a third of their time on the ground. So the most of any of those over 100 species of lemurs. So when they're walking along the ground, so you can kind of see, I think that's Lucy. Yeah, that's Lucy. They actually hold it up or in an S shape, and that way they can keep track of one another when they're walking along uh, in the forests or along the, the arid areas. So at the Toronto Zoo, they get a different uh, quite a variety in their diet. So they'll get pretty much any fruit or vegetable you guys would find in the grocery store. It varies day to day. They love the fruit. The fruit is their favorite part, the sweetest. So banana and grapes are definitely a favorite. You guys might have seen them snacking on some of that on the window earlier. Um, and then they also get, it's kind of like a dry dog or cat food, but it's actually made for primates. So they're just little um, dry pro, uh, primate sticks that we call them. It's not their favorite part, but sometimes we'll put a little bit of juice um, on them so the, the pellets will soak up the juice and then they like it a lot better than <laughs> that. They also get some produce a few times a week. So they'll actually, um, if we take a head of romaine and then we can hand out a, le a whole leaf to them, they'll mow down on that. Um, they do also get some browse, which is basically tree clippings. And here in the Africa Pavilion, we actually have a tree called the tamarind tree, which is native to Madagascar, which is where these guys are from. Uh, and in the dry season, this tamarind tree is actually about 50% of the ring-tailed lemur's diet. So we're actually able to provide them some um, here in our pavilion because all of our pavilions actually have plants that are native to the areas um, where the animals come from as well. So it's pretty cool to be able to offer them that. They also will get some apple tree brows and some willow. So they have quite the varied diet. Now in the wild, they will sometimes eat uh, little bugs, um, but we've tried different insects with these guys. They don't seem so keen on them. But as I said, the fruit is really their favorite. Now you can see that's Joshua tree, I think hanging upside down. That's actually quite, um, natural behavior for them for when they are foraging they will use those back feet and hang and grab stuff so that's awesome that we got to see that when we do enrich our animals that's kind of what we want is to elicit some natural behavior so it's really cool um, you'll watch them if you do see any of them walking along the ropes they use that tail for balance some people think because um, some monkeys are able to use their tails kind of as an extra hand these guys cannot um, but they do use that tail to balance when they are walking along um, ropes or along the trees. <laughs> now you can see our, <coughs> excuse me, our lemurs are pretty gentle. Um, we've been working with them since they've been at the zoo. Now some of them are actually born at the zoo. Um, so it's much better for them to be nice and calm around us. If they have any medical issues, it's easy. Um, they're trained to go in their crates and they're trained to go on a scale so we can do um, basic husbandry for them, so it's really important to keep an eye on their weight. Um, some of our lemurs are a little bit chubbier than they should be, but uh, it's nice to know uh, their weight ranges, and we do usually weigh them once a month, um, and then we can do other training with them as well. They will target to a target pole so you can move the lemur around. And another thing that's cool about ring-tailed lemurs is that, and a lot of lemur species, is that the female females are actually the dominant one. So usually, um, especially with great apes, um, you have the male that's males that are dominant. But in the lemur world, it's generally the female. So the females will decide um, who to breed with, they will decide that they're going to eat first, where the troop is going to eat. So the troop is actually led by the females. And usually females will stay in their troop that they're born in, whereas males, once they're mature, around two or three years of age, will move along to other troops. Do we have any questions coming in?
We have so many people in this session, it's ridiculous. It's the most of any of our programs all day. There are over eight full classrooms on YouTube, plus our five lives. There's 350 plus kids here right now. So yeah, Sonia, Travis, if you guys are okay with it, we can dive in with questions. And then if there are any other big things you want to mention that we don't get in Q&A, you can absolutely end off with that. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Sure. Fantastic, guys. All right. Well, uh, again, a huge welcome into classes all across Ontario, Canada, and the United States. Uh, so fantastic to have you all here. If you're on YouTube, please do share your questions. I'd love to take as many as we can. But what we're going to do is begin with Miss Sutherland's class. Miss Sutherland's class is joining us live in Ottawa, Ontario. If you guys would like to pick us off, come on up. Hi, guys. Do you have any questions about the today? Can we come here? Yeah, come a little closer to the camera. I uh, miss Sutherland. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Have you ever seen a real lemur snake bite, but not in, not at the Toronto Zoo in the real wild? Yeah, cool question. So, Travis, have you guys seen a real lemur snake bite in the wild? <laughs> So I work with a different species in the wild and I haven't seen them stink bite, but I have seen what they do is they take their chests and they'll rub it on different trees. And then other competing males who want to take that tree will also rub their chest on that tree to make sure they put their stink on it. So it's kind of a, a subtle form of fighting. They don't really fight each other with the stink. They just leave the stink on the tree for the other one to find later. Fantastic. Thanks, Travis. By the way, great mask. I don't know where you can get a lemur mask like that, but that is super cool. All right. Let's go to Miss Blackie's class. They're joining us live in Oshawa. Come on in. Just demute your mic, guys, and go for it. Okay. I'm going to ask a question for Will. Perfect. He would like to know how they climb trees. Do they use their claws? Yeah. So they don't, they have little nails, but you can see they basically are really good jumpers. So they kind of jump up and they'll use their hands to grip, but they don't really, they don't really use nails because they don't really have very long nails. But they have, if you saw their feet earlier on the window, they have really cool toes. Um, <laughs> they kind of look kind of like, I don't know, cushiony, <laughs> but yeah, they don't have very long nails, but yeah, they will climb up by jumping mostly and then using those little hands. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Tanya. All right, Miss Green's class. They tried to come in live, but tech didn't work, so they're joining on YouTube. And Sophia in the class wants to know if they're herbivores, omnivores, or carnivores. So technically, you could say they're omnivores because they do eat some insects in the wild. As I said, here at the Toronto Zoo, they're not that fond of it, but they do mainly eat fruits and leaves, barks, um, saps, and then a bit of greener, like a bit of greenery here at the zoo too. Yeah, awesome, great question, guys. We're ripping through these. These are great questions, everybody. So let's go to Miss Redmond's class. They're in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. If you want to de your microphone, come on in. All right. Okay. So are lemurs in the wild unique to Madagascar? And if that's true, how did they become unique to one area? Yeah, so lemurs are only found on the island of Madagascar naturally. And it's kind of a long story, but the, the island itself split from Africa and India about 80 to 90 million years ago. But primates only arrived on the planet about 50 million years ago. So there's this 30 million year gap where there was no primates on Madagascar. And somehow they got there. And the leading hypothesis is they actually rafted across the ocean. Now, how did that happen? They don't build rafts themselves. But imagine a massive tropical cyclone. Lots of these cyclones will do storm surges into the landscape and rip out vegetation out to the sea, sometimes the size of the area of Toronto. And on those mats of vegetation are all the animals and plants that were in that forest. And so eventually, if that sails in the right direction with the right winds, those species can transport from one continent to another island. And we see this today. It's just extremely, extremely rare. But it only had to have happened once. We've now learned that maybe it actually happened twice. And that is a type of lemur called the eye eye that came over in a second wave of, of primate explosion into Madagascar. 
That is super cool. I'm going to bring up the name II on the screen for those of you who might not know how to spell it. Check out the II. They're one of the weirdest, coolest creatures in the entire world. And by the way, I think if you're at home, if you can find something in your life that you love and are as enthused about as Travis is about lemurs, you are set. So try and find something that you're as passionate about because this is awesome. All right. Uh, let's go to Miss Holt's class. They're joining us in Innisfail, Alberta. You guys have a question for us? Come on. Hey, Miss Holt's class. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, are any types of lemurs endangered? Yeah. Actually, unfortunately, yes. Most lemur species are threatened in one way or another. Specifically, the ring-tailed lemurs are considered endangered, but I think it's over 90% now of all lemur species. So those hundred, over 100 species, most of them are either threatened, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. So it's really bad. So. Lemurs as a group are actually known by the IUCN as uh, the world's most endangered group of mammals. Pretty sad. Yeah. Um, it's something we've been covering all day in terms of conservation. And one of the things that we've always liked to highlight uh, throughout Lemur Day is the fact that you guys can work to you know, take action yourselves as classrooms. Uh, Travis and Sonia would both mention the fact that education is where it starts. The fact that you guys are here today learning about lemurs is a huge step towards making sure we can save them, uh, save their habitats as well. And then there are amazing organizations like Planet Madagascar, which Travis runs, like the Duke Lemur Center, which we covered earlier today, where you guys can take real action to help save lemurs in their natural habitat. Toronto Zoo also has some amazing programs that you guys can learn about in terms of supporting conservation efforts. So check all those out. We'll be sharing that with all our live groups uh, via email after this is done and throughout the broadcast. Great answer, guys. All right, Miss Seraphim's class, you guys are joining in Milton, uh, Ontario. Just demute your microphone, come on up, and then we'll take a few from YouTube. Hey, Miss Seraphim, <laughs> welcome in. Hello, Hi. we're from Milton, Ontario. Oh. Can you ask your question? Sure. Okay, so we have some students in our class who really love lemurs, and our question yeah. is, um, why female lemurs are more dominant? Yeah. Why are females more dominant? <laughs> you know what? I don't know why, but that's just the way it, like, it came about. Lemur or females just tend to show more dominance. As I said, normally in primates, it's usually the males, but not really sure why. Maybe I don't know if Travis has any clue? It's a, very, it's a very interesting question, and there's no direct answer to it. The, some of the short, the short version is that the, the types of habitats that lemurs live in are very dynamic, and they're very random. So the predictability of resources is, is well, it's very unpredictable. And females require more resources because they give babies. So in this case, the, there's a theory or a hypothesis that they became dominant so they can take control of those resources, um, but it really depends. With gorillas, it's a really great example. They live in sort of a salad bowl, so they can much more easily find food. Um, but this is a, a working working theory. People are still working on it. So maybe when you grow older, you can go to Madagascar and you could research this and figure it out. Yeah. Super cool. I always love when we have questions that touch upon the fact that science isn't complete. There's so much more to discover, so much more to learn out there. So great question to sort of stump our speakers today. Thanks so much, I Ms. Seraphim Scott. All right, we're going to take a few on YouTube before we dive back in with our live groups. So uh, let's go first to Ms. Lee's class joining us in Ottawa. A question from Noor today. Uh, what do the zookeepers do when the lemurs are having a tantrum or is biting? <laughs> Sorry, Jesse, could you repeat just the end of that question again? Yeah, so if, if the lemurs are biting or having a tantrum, we don't even know if that happens. If that happens, what do the zookeepers do to keep safe, I guess? Well, we are lucky that they don't actually try to bite us usually. If they're having a little bit of a, a squabble, we just let them be. We don't try to get in the middle of it. They're, it's usually because, you know, a female wants the food or whatever that a male has tried to get, and they just sort it out themselves. They just kind of stay away. And as I said, we're pretty lucky. Um, they're very friendly with us. They know their keepers. Um, they know we're not trying to hurt them or anything. So we haven't actually had to deal with that situation with them. Phew, that's good to hear. Um, let's go to Ms. Chu's class. Uh, they're joining in Ontario, I, or Ms. Chartrand's class, grade eight. I love this question. We get it with a lot of animal groups. It's a tough question to answer, but I think it's really important to try and answer. So what benefits do lemurs offer the world or nature and humans? Why, why are lemurs important to us? Why are lemurs important? So why should we care about lemurs? Well, one thing that I think is fascinating about them is they're primates. We are also primates. 
and they represent a group of primates that have very unique adaptations. And so we have a shared evolutionary history. So understanding them actually helps us understand a little bit about ourselves. That's sort of one of the main reasons why I study primates to begin with, because I want to understand, you know, how did humans become humans? And to do that, we need to understand our cousins and our relatives like the lemurs. Fantastic. Uh, again, look up Travis's organization, Planet Madagascar. We'll bring that up again on the screen. So the idea is, is that it's a microcosm of what could happen to the whole world in general. So Madagascar is a beautiful case study of, uh, you know, sort of human conflicts with wildlife, with habitat, with conservation. There's so many amazing stories that happen in Madagascar that apply to the world on the whole. So by learning and understanding things about lemurs, uh, we can take those actions and apply them to other conservation stories around the world and help protect one of the most endangered and incredible groups of wildlife in the world in lemurs. So great question, guys. Thank you so, so much. All right. I love this question uh, from the Greco family there in North Carolina. They've been joining all day long. Uh, it's a really astute question. So Tavin's been to multiple zoos and they always have lemurs, but they only have ring-tailed lemurs. Is there a reason ring-tailed lemurs are preferentially in zoos? I don't think there's a, they're prefer preferentially in zoos. They are just, um, they're the most common. Um, they breed really well in captivity. So most of our animals at the zoo are, are part of what's called an SSP, which is the species survival plan. So that means that their genetics are looked at. Each individual in every zoo in all of North America are looked at, and then uh, they're usually moved from zoo to zoo to keep the best genetic diversity available. So they breed really easily in zoos. So I think that's why they're quite common. Um, in the wild, they can have twins, but it's pretty rare, whereas in zoos, Twins are very common with ring-tailed lemurs. Um, and yeah, it's just usually the people, when people think of a lemur, they think of a ring-tailed lemur. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, I'm so glad you touched upon species survival plans. One of the things we've got in some of our other sessions today is this idea of lemurs being in captivity. If they're so endangered, why have them in a zoo or a facility where they're they're outside of Madagascar? And in some cases, uh, captivity cannot be the best for animals, but with the Toronto Zoo, it's part of something called the Canadian Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or CASA. You can see this in the United States too. The AZA is an organization that accredits these facilities to highlight the fact that they're at the pinnacle of animal care, animal conservation, and more. So zoos are actually taking a really active role in preserving some of the world's most endangered and wild species. So check out azda.org, CASA.ca. Uh, you can check out uh, some of the amazing work that they're doing to protect species. So thanks for, for touching upon the, the captivity angle, guys. All right, let's go back to our live classes. I want to start with Miss Sutherland's group. If you guys have another question for us, come on back up. Everyone's got a question. <laughs> so you're a little too far from the camera. I'm sorry, Sutherland. Could you repeat that for me? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. So high. Why do lemurs jump so high? Why do lemurs jump so high? They jump so high because they have lots of cool muscles in their legs that help them leap. So the term leap and lemurs is really true. They just have that awesome strength that they can jump. Awesome. Cool muscles are the best kind of muscles, I find. Um, let's head back to Cottage Grove, Miss Redmond's class. If you guys have a question for us, come on back in. Uh, how, many, how many different kinds of lemurs are there? How many different kinds are there in total? So the number of lemurs is approximately about 111 different species that exist today. And there's roughly about 16 that have gone extinct in the last 2,000 years. So that would be give or take about 130 if we included the extinct ones. Yeah. Um it's a question we've been getting all day. So you can check out some of those lemurs. Uh, with Travis's talk at nine in the morning, he showcased a picture with some of the amazing lemur species around the world. I'd encourage you to check that out and see some of our other programs today for some of the incredible diversity of lemurs that are out there in Madagascar. All right, uh, Miss Green's class. Again, they were supposed to be live. I'm gonna take their question from YouTube. Um, Axis, curious, how do you know which are boys and which are girls, Travis and Sonia? So for these guys, they're actually, <laughs> These guys are pretty similar in size. So they're mostly around three kilos. Um, I've read that males are supposed to be a little bit bigger, but it doesn't seem to be the case in our troop. And the boys will have the scent glands uh, around their chest area, whereas the girls usually don't. Yeah. Anything oh. to add, Travis? <laughs> Sometimes if you get a look between their legs, you, you get another view and that helps you out a little bit too. <laughs> 
<laughs> and thank you for that uh, biology lesson 101. Awesome. All right, uh, Miss Blackie's class, if you guys want in Oshawa, come on back in for another question. We'll go for it. Um, <laughs> I'm worried this might have been answered already, but uh, why are their tails striped or ringed? Yeah. Why are they striped? Why do they have striped tails? Yeah. That, that's a very good question. The, the, the different coloration species have is, is actually fairly poorly studied. or, or It's not that it's poorly studied. It's, it's very difficult to determine. One reason might be for signaling so that they can signal each other and for group movements, they can identify other individuals in the group. Um, it could be for um, uh, other forms of communication. We don't really know. Uh, I, it, there's some hypotheses with regards to zebra uh, stripes, zebra stripes. That might have to do with with uh, preventing flies from biting. So there could be many different reasons, but we don't really know for ringtail lemurs. Awesome, guys! We are whipping through these questions. This is great. So much opportunity to learn so much today. Um, all right, we're going to go to Toronto to Miss Wilbick's class on YouTube. So, do lemurs get sick? And how long do lemurs live in the zoo versus in the wild? So, do they get sick? How long captivity versus? So lemurs, um, our lemurs are pretty healthy. They do get sick sometimes, just like any other animal. Um, but there's not really a disease that affects ring-tailed lemurs specifically. Um, in the wild, 15-ish years, 20 maybe. Um, in zoos, there are actually some 30-year-old lemurs. So that's kind of rare, more like, you know, a 100-year-old person. But they do live a little bit longer in zoos um, than they do in the wild. Another one of those examples, I think a lot of people assume that things would live longer in the wild, but in a zoo, they're cared for, they have their food provided for, if they get sick, they have medical checkups. The Toronto Zoo has a really fantastic world-class medical facility, so it often uh, ends up being the case that animals live longer in captivity uh, when that sort of care is provided for. Great question, guys. All right, let's head to Ms. Holt's group, and then we'll go to Ms. Seraphin's group live. So Ms. Holt, back at Innisfail. Are mouse lemurs as vicious as some people say they are? I don't know if you caught that, Mary Ellen and the team. Are mouse lemurs as vicious as some people say they are? Yeah. Oh, okay. So <laughs> mouse lemurs are, are voracious predators when they hunt uh, insects and things like that. And I have worked with colleagues who, who, who will trap them. And when they trap them, they're, they're, they're dumbfounded by the idea that suddenly something larger than them is holding them and they will viciously try to bite your fingertips off. Um, they're tiny little creatures about the size of an egg, um, and they can be very aggressive. They make terrible pets. Um, they're kind of like kind of like a mouse that's, uh, that's, that's high on Halloween candy all the time, trying to bounce around, and when you touch it, it wants to bite your fingers. <laughs> There's an image. Um, Travis, actually, I'm going to follow up on that. You talked about them being terrible pets. It's something that we've been covering all day. A lot of people think lemurs are very cute. Maybe they could make good pets. Can you explain a little bit about lemurs as pets and, and maybe animals as pets in general, why that might not be a good idea? Yeah, so with most primates, uh, primates are very uh, cognitive and they're very social and they require a lot of interaction. And so you, you've seen the zookeepers here put, do a lot of enrichment to make sure that the lemurs... Um, have a, a sort of happy lifestyle. But it's very hard to do that if you have a single lemur in a household. And even if you have multiple lemurs, you would have to essentially quit your job and become your own zookeeper just to make sure that those animals are taken care of. And primates specifically make terrible pets. Remember, they're smart, they're strong, and they go to the bathroom a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I'm really glad we got that message in. It's something we always like to talk about in conservation stories. So thank you guys so much for that. All right. Uh, Ms. Sarah, I'm going to bring right back to you. There's just so many questions pouring in on YouTube. I'm trying to keep on top of them from our teachers. So Ms. Henson Hewitt's class wants to know, do the different species of lemur get along? Are there any inter-lemur fighting going on? Yeah. Vicious little mouse lemur attacks. <laughs> sure. The, so there are species that live together. We call that sympatric. So they live in the same areas. And I've seen situations where uh, there's shifakas um, uh, living near brown lemurs, which are very similar to these ringtail lemurs. And the brown lemurs constantly tease the shifakas by pulling their tails and grabbing their ears. Um, and so they do, they get along to a point, but the one always bugs the other one. Um, but they do often overlap. And some species that are closely related will sometimes live amongst each other. And I've seen species that are very related 
actually uh, uh, adopt individuals from other species. And in some cases, they can interbreed and, and create hybrids. And you see that in certain parts of Madagascar. Yeah. Super cool. Thanks for the thorough answer. All right, let's go to Miss Seraphin's class. Finally, sorry for the wait, guys. Come on back in, demute your mic, and you're good to go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we were wondering, it's a little bit of a sad question, but we were wondering at the Toronto Zoo this year if there were any lemurs that have passed away. So we did, uh, I believe it was in April, there was, uh, Larry was actually part of this troop and he passed away. Um, he ended up with a disease um, and he actually, we were medicating him for probably about eight or nine months, um, but unfortunately it was not doing well for him. So they did euthanize him and that's, it's a really hard thing, um, but it was best, it's best, it was what was best for Larry at the time because this quality of life wasn't good. So this year, yeah, we used to have 10 ring-tailed lemurs in two groups, and now we have nine. Yeah. Thank you for answering that candidly. It's not a question that we get very often, but I think it's important to highlight. And again, the scale of the medical care that you tried to provide or, or did provide. So thank you so much for that, Sonia. Um, all right, uh, we are ripping through these. So I'm gonna take a few more questions from YouTube, go back through with all our live groups for one more, and then we'll wrap up from there. So, um, Unira in Miss Lee's class wants to know, do different types of lemurs have different behaviors or ways of living? And does that relate to how they go extinct or their endangerment in any way? Yeah, so there's many different lemurs and there's many different ways of being a lemur. Some are nocturnal, some are diurnal. So those two types live and move through the forest very differently. Some are actually cathemeral. So they're diurnal and nocturnal depending on the season. And so does this impact how they can be conserved or, or whether or not they're endangered? Well, it does. If you are an animal that lives during the day and you live high up in the trees and someone cuts down all the tall trees, well, you're not gonna be able to survive as well. But maybe if you're nocturnal and you can use some of the smaller trees, then you might survive in that exact same area. And so we see this even with ringtail lemurs. With their habitat loss, they may shrink in size while other species like mouse lemurs who live in the same area might not have the same problem. So how lemurs live and how they behave is very different. Some live in very large groups, some live in small groups. All these things interact to, to determine um, how uh, at risk they are for, for extinction. Fantastic, guys. All right, let's go to Ms. Sutherland's class again. Make sure to come really close to the camera. If you have another question for us, go for it. Oh, one more time. We're, we're not catching it, guys. Sorry. Do lemurs get scared? Do lemurs get scared? Thank you. Yeah, uh, lemurs can get scared just like any other animal. So these guys are considered prey, um, a prey animal more so. So their predators in Madagascar would be things like the fossa, um, different birds of prey, so like hawks or eagles. Um, and actually big, big snakes like the Madagascar, Madagascar brown boa are also predators. So they actually have something called an alarm call. So Travis was saying about all those different vocalizations that lemurs make, um, well, specifically the ring tails. And so they actually have what's called an alarm call. When they see a predator, they'll make that call just to let everybody know. And then they can all scatter and try to get away from that predator. Super cool. And I want to highlight for everyone on the screen, uh, the fossa on the bottom. So check that out when you're done this broadcast. Go look them up. They're like a turbo weasel that hunts lemurs. They're super cool. They're a beautiful animal. Uh, I encourage you to use that as a nice follow-up. All right, Miss Blackie's class, come on back up. And uh, then we'll go to Miss Holt and Seraphin back to back. So Miss Blackie's group, come on in. Okay. Um, how intelligent are lemurs? Do you have any examples that show their intelligence? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. So it's always relative. If you're talking about how intelligent they are relative to say monkeys or apes, um, you might say that they're not as intelligent because they don't make tools. They don't, um, they don't have the same uh, sort of abilities to sort of map and understand their environment, but they are very intelligent how to figure out how to get food, how to find food. Uh, I usually say they're as smart as they need to be to live in the environment they are. 
And so there are no competitors for lemurs in Madagascar. Lemurs are the only type of primate, so they don't have to compete with other types of primates. So their, their cognitive abilities don't need to develop as well. So they're as smart as they need to be, sometimes seeming a little less smart than they should be, uh, but eventually they come around to it and they learn what they need to know. Ah, uh, so much nuance in that answer. I love it. All right, uh, Ms. McCartney's class, they wanted to know, uh, how big are lemurs when they're born? Travis or Sonia? So we've actually had quite a few babies born here at the Toronto Zoo. Size-wise, I don't know grammage, probably less than 100 grams, but the ones when they're newborns, like literally about this big, and believe it or not, they actually have those cute little striped tails from birth. And then they kind of have really big ears, so they're kind of, I don't know, like a gremlin sort of baby. Like the babies are adorable. So we were really fortunate to have many babies here. <laughs> uh, if you want to see some really, really cute baby lemurs, I know the Duke Lemur Center's presentation uh, in the last hour had some awesome pictures. So you can check out some babies and some really handsome lemurs. Um, all right, guys. Miss Holt, I'm coming to you. Miss Serafin, I see your students ready. So Miss Holt, come on in with a question, and we'll wrap up with Miss Serafin in a minute. Why do lemurs look like monkeys and why do they act like humans? Why do they look like monkeys but act like humans? Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. the so lemurs act like monkey or look like monkeys. I kind of think they look a little bit like a monkey cat. They got a little bit longer nose, kind of an <laughs> unusual shape. Um, but yeah, they're monkey like. Um, but if in fact, if you spend a lot of time with all primates, you might start seeing that many primates act like humans. And actually, the way I look at it, Humans act like a lot of primates. And so, and the reason is, is that humans are a type of primate. So we're essentially a great ape. And so we are actually relatively closely related to lemurs compared to all the other mammals in the world. And so that might be why. One of the main things you might be uh, picking up on is that they live in groups and often these groups are families. And so that's what seems familiar to us because they will be related individuals who live near each other. So they have the same relationships you might have with your sister, your brother, your cousin, your mom and your aunt or your uncle. And so they, they, those bonds and those family relationships exist in lemurs, but they also do in many different primate species as well. Awesome, a great follow up to this um, from Rayleigh in North Carolina. Do you study the lemurs and what's the most interesting thing you've seen the lemurs do either at the zoo or in the wild? Um, well, in the wild, I guess the one of the, I've, I've seen so many lemurs do so many strange things. Uh, one of the weirdest things that my partner, Carrie Ann, when she did her research, she found that there's this one piece of dead bark that all the lemurs would incessantly lick and they would lick it for hours. And we suspected it must have had some sort of mineral or something in it. And then the next day they would move far into their habitat and they would come back to the same dead tree and lick this thing again. And so that was kind of an unusual thing. Um, we got to experience this time when it's really hot, the lemurs will come down from the trees and they'll often sit around you in the shade uh, in the middle of the day because they kind of see you when you're doing research as just another big lemur that, that, uh, that follows them around. So the funniest thing or strangest thing that I've seen here at the zoo is one of our male ring-tailed lemurs actually tried to have a stink bite with the crown cranes. So that's really funny because the crown crane has no idea what's going on and the lemur was actually trying to do the stink bite with him. So that was probably the, the weirdest thing I've seen. <laughs> See, when the competitor doesn't even take part, you just automatically win. And that's kind of the, the point, I think. Um, all right, Miss Serafin's class, if you guys want to wrap us up, do you need your mic? Come on in. Okay. I have a student who's going to ask the question, if that's okay. Do it. How many babies can a mother uh, give birth to on average? Okay. Um, I don't know. How many babies can a mother give birth to? In their lifetime? I, I can answer. If it, if you're talking about in their lifetime, it depends on each species. So some species will have a new baby every year and they may breed from the moment they become an adult. That's uh, about two to three years for some species till the day, uh, to the year they die. So they, they could have up to 20 depending on the species, but, but it depends on their interbirth interval. So how long they, they retain the previous infant and, and then go back into, into breeding status. And some species, that's two to three years. So then they're only having a new baby every other year. What is it like for the ringtails here? So we, they had babies every year for three or four years, I think it was. 
So we had, yeah, we had five babies. We had one baby the first year, five babies the second year, and then we had two babies the third year. So it was yearly, and it was the babies were usually born anywhere between April and June. So it was always seasonal as well. What an amazing amount of uh, births you guys have. I think a lot of people might not know uh, zoos and aquariums. It's often quite difficult to get animals to breed. So that sort of uh, number uh, it speaks back to the question earlier of why rainbow are there. That's amazing uh, results. So Sonia and Travis, I'm going to ask in a minute, uh, sort of like a last wrap up, anything you'd want to share with the classes. But first, I just want to share with everyone again, World Lemur Day. Check out torontozoo.com. Uh, they've got amazing educational resources. They are open to the public for all our classes in the GTA. See the ringtails live. Uh, do a boomobile uh, as well over their Halloween festivities. The uh, Duke Lemur Center, something we've been covering all day. Check out their website there. And then Travis, of course, is from Planet Madagascar. So you can see all the amazing work they're doing to conserve lemurs and see how you can take part, donate, learn more, uh, and just in general help conserve lemurs on their website. So with that, uh, Travis and Sonia, is there any last method you'd like to share with our classrooms today for what they can do to learn more, how they can take action, anything you'd like? Great. So yes, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to stop by and see the lemurs here. Uh, Planet Madagascar is very grateful that you take the time to learn about lemurs. We're really grateful to the Toronto Zoo and the staff here who take care of these lemurs, but they also help contribute to the work we do in Madagascar. So without the Toronto Zoo, some of the projects that we're doing to protect lemurs wouldn't be possible. Uh, one other thing is that later today, in partnership with the Toronto Zoo and the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, we'll be having a, an event where we we have a, a few different lemur researchers and primate researchers talk about their sort of global state of conservation of primates and lemurs. So feel free to stay tuned for that at 3 p.m. And I just wanted to say thank you for joining us for another Facebook Live. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's support. And go and support some lemurs. Happy World Lemur Day. Thank you so, so much, uh, Sonia and Travis. What a fantastic session. So nice to get to see the lemurs live. And so what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teacher. So Ms. Holt, Ms. Blackie, Ms. Sutherland, Ms. Serafin, if you want to join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye to the team at the zoo and Planet Madagascar. Thanks, guys. Bye.